for somebody before me. No, that's a problem. Okay, I'm going to put one on the table and I'm going to put that in there. I don't get too much stuff. Yeah. And then they're going to move my computer over. So. Okay. Alrighty. All right. Seriously, if I... If I Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm so excited to welcome you to our Best Buddy Center. I'm absolutely thrilled we have such a terrific crowd for our Women's Leadership Council evening, and we have an exceptional guest tonight, and I'm so excited. She's going to be introduced in just a few minutes, but before we get to our fabulous speaker, Dr. Carolyn Henry, I first wanted to introduce Maureen McCarthy. Maureen is a member of the Women's Leadership Council. She also serves on our executive committee, and we are very happy that she's going to be doing our member moment, just talking a little bit about the Women's Leadership Council before we get started with our main presentation. And we have some terrific raffle prizes tonight for those who join or upgrade, so please, help me um, give, by giving Maureen a big, big hand. Maureen, welcome. Thank you, Kathy. Well, welcome, everybody. It's great to see you. And, and isn't it great to be together face-to-face -face for a change? Huh. We're glad you're here. Um, the Women's Leadership Council is an affinity group within the Humane Society. And we were formed in 2007. And we raise funds, and we, those funds go directly towards programs. Every year, we select different programs. So in 2021, our programs are CHIEF and SNP. CHIEF is the Caring Heart Inspired Emergency Fund. And that is a fund that helps people pay for animal care, animal surgeries, when they can't afford pet care. And the fund is really a discretionary, it's a fund that at the discretion of the Humane Society medical director, they can use it to help families that couldn't afford care for their animals. And if that fund didn't exist, those people would have to surrender their animals. So this is one of our big programs we're raising money for this year. The other program is SNP. And you may have heard of SNP because this is our second year that we're funding this important program. SNP is a spay and neuter program, spay and neuter incentive program for dogs and cats in St. Louis and in our community. Just last year in 2020, this program funded surgery for over 3,500 cats and dogs in our community. And this is really important because not only are we helping people care for their animals, we're controlling animal population in our city. And it's made a difference in the city in the terms of the dogs that perhaps ran in the city. So SNP and CHIEF are what the Women's Leadership Council are working on this year. And the um, council was fo formed in 2007. We have raised over a million dollars to date to help the Humane Society. You guys know the Humane Society does amazing work. And the, um, I actually became involved with the Women's Leadership Council when I attended Purses for Pooches. So many of you have probably gone to that fabulous event. It's usually in June, and we hope to have it next year back in person. Anyway, I became aware of the Women's Leadership Council, and I joined in 2012. I'm a dog owner. My dog is Riley, who I adopted 13 years ago. 
and he's the cutest dog. And I'll show you a slideshow of him. No, I'm kidding. But he, like many of you, you love your animals. They've made a difference in your life, and you have compassion for dogs, cats, or horses, or whatever animals have made a difference in your life. So as I became involved with WLC, I realized the dedication, the passion, the commitment from Humane Society staff, from the veterinarian people, from the marketing people. I also got to know so many fabulous people through the Women's Leadership Council. So I'm more involved now than I have been in prior years, and it's the kind of group, I think, that's very friendly and welcoming. So we hope that you'll join and support the WLC by becoming a member. Um, if you join tonight, or if you want to renew tonight, or you want to upgrade, you can be entered in a raffle, and we have three fabulous Tory Birch purses as prizes. So if you are a member, you'll be invited to various events. Last year we had to pivot, and instead of having our normal events in person like this, we went online and we hosted different events to keep our members engaged. We had online book clubs and other events. So if you attended those online events, great. But we hope moving forward, beginning with tonight, we have in-person events. If you're an active member of WLC, you can join us for our holiday party in December, and you'll get invited to that event. It's a wonderful, fun holiday event. So please consider joining. You may have gotten one of these farms when you came in. Feel free to ask me questions or any of the WLC steering committee members or Libby. So join tonight. We really need your support, and we thank you very much for being here. And we're going to watch a little video.
Okay, so we forgot the Kleenex alert, right? <laughs> and I always get to go after the dog. Oh, I think I can take my mask off up here and breathe for a minute. Thank you. All right. Well, it is my honor tonight, in just a few minutes, to be able to introduce Dr. Carolyn Henry. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge my co-chair of our event tonight, Mary Eddington. Would you please stand, Mary? Thank you so much. Round of applause. Mary was successful in getting Edward Jones to underwrite the event tonight, so thank you so much for that. All right, also we would be remiss if we did not thank all of the many hands behind the scenes here at the Humane Society. I don't know how they always pull these off to perfection. I mean, we kind of had to pivot. Normally we don't have these luxury box, you know, snacks, but I don't know, you think they were pretty good? Yeah, I, I'm kind of used to, all right, round of applause. I'm kind of used to eating out of a styrofoam box, so this is like way of an upgrade for me. All right, well tonight I'm going to introduce Dr. Carolyn Henry, and the topic is going to be failure of fear. So by a show of hands, how many of you were ever in a situation where you experienced fear? Yeah, just a few times, right? Been there, done that? Exactly. Well, I have a feeling that after tonight, we will be viewing that fear a little bit differently. At least I hope I will be. So I do have to share with you, some 20 plus years ago is when I actually met Carolyn Henry. And coincidentally, we were putting on a seminar as a fundraiser. And when I say we, it was our retired greyhounds as pets organization here in St. Louis, and canine cancer was a big topic. Well, I was assigned to find somebody to talk about that. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to call that vet school in Columbia and, you know, see if they have somebody that will come and speak. Well, the lovely receptionist said, well, I'll put you in touch with Dr. Henry. She might do it. Well, lo and behold, she did. She said she would do it. So I had the privilege of introducing her at that event. So I'm online looking up, you know, how am I going to introduce her? And I was like, wow, this lady has some credentials. Um, I realized very shortly that I had acquired an internationally known speaker and the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine's first board certified oncologist. So big score. All right, so fast forward even a, just probably a few months later, and I will share that one of the things that Carol and I kind of have bonded over is that we don't believe in coincidences. Well, here's a coincidence for you. Like I said, a few months after this seminar, my greyhound was diagnosed with a pituitary macroadenoma. So she got to undergo quite a bit of radiation treatment at Mizzou. But because of the relationship and friendship I had built with Carolyn, it really relieved a lot of my anxiety about having that done. So it removed a little bit of the fear. Now I'm going to use my notes because I'm not going to go over Carolyn's biography with you, but I do want to share with you a few of her accomplishments in her professional background. So she earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree at Auburn. Anybody here from Auburn? It's another tiger school. It's pretty far away, though, Carolyn. Don't feel, don't feel bad. Um, she practiced small animal medicine and emergency medicine in Alabama and Georgia. And then she returned to Auburn to complete her oncology residency and Master of Science degree. She then traveled across the country, spent four years as a faculty member at Washington State, and then joined Mizzou in 1997 as the college's first board-certified oncologist. In 2001, she received dual appointment at the MU School of Medicine. That's the human hospital, so a pretty big deal. In 2002, she became the Director of Veterinary Oncology with many distinguished awards along the way. So I have to ask tonight, I said Edward Jones was a sponsor. I've seen some of my friends here from Edward Jones. Raise your hand if you, if you are affiliated with Edward Jones as your employer. Okay, and the reason I ask this, and this will ring home to you, and I bet it rings home to many other folks in corporate America as well, but you have to do the job before you get the job, right? 
All right, so Dr. Henry was the interim dean before being selected as the dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine in February 2018. So extremely impressive credentials. But I also want to introduce you to Carolyn, the total person. I'm going to steal a line that she used at her former husband's memorial. She shared that her deceased husband had made her a biological mom, an adoptive mom, a stepmom, and a single mom. And since that time, she's become a grandmother. So certainly room for fear with any of those roles, let alone in the aggregate. Simultaneously with those important family roles, Carolyn is the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Missouri, Columbia. So fast forward some 20 years and many, no coincidences later, Carolyn is someone that I truly respect and am grateful to call my friend. And once again, she has generously accepted my request to speak to yet another group of pet lovers. So let's see what we're going to learn about the failure of fear. Carolyn? Countdown. <laughs> All right, I'm old enough, I gotta wear the glasses now, so I'm taking the mask off because I still haven't figured out how to not fog my glasses. I'm trying, if you got a trick that actually works, let me know, or a mask that actually works. Anyway, um, so those of you that remember Paul Harvey, there's always the rest of the story, right? So I love, Marilyn, that you, you presented that in a way that made so much sense. <laughs> And my career made absolutely no sense. And like the trajectory and the pathway I took, um, it sounds like it was planned, and in no way was it planned, at least not by me. So I, I share the, uh, the giggle that I get over thinking about what, what's a coincidence and not, what's not. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out by saying I am going to put my very authentic self out there with you people tonight. Um, the intent of this is not to tell you all the great things that we do at the University of Missouri. This is a women's leadership council, and we need to have women leaders that get it. And I know a lot of you in the crowd because you get it. And, and so I'm never going to say no to these kind of talks because this is, where, this is where the fun stuff happens. So instead of having a fear of failure, I want to talk about having a failure of fear and how to get past that and how we really need to go through those experiences to become the person that we're meant to be. All right, so I told you I'm going to be very um, real and authentic. It does not get more authentic than this. <laughs> so um, this was me at the age I, I think I probably knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. I knew I wasn't going to have great hair. <laughs> I, I knew that my mother, who used a piece of ta scotch tape across my bangs and then cut along the line. Anybody else? Yeah? Yeah. I also had the bowl cut. So now I just shave the sides and I do my own thing. So anyway, this is about the age that I started thinking, I kind of, I like animals. I think I'd like to be a veterinarian, but I really didn't know what the entire um, capacity for veterinarians was at the time, nor did, did any of us, I think. So my dad worked for Ford. Um, my aunt Ellie was a, uh, a comedy writer, and then her last job was with, with Purina here in St. Louis. Um, she, she actually named Checkerboard Square. She, and she named a seal at the, at the zoo named Archie Dunker at the time. So um, uh, kudos to her. She's an amazing woman. But th that was my role model growing up. That was like, she was so unconventional and so darn cool. I was like, all right, she's got it together. So my dad, as I said, worked for Ford, and we got transferred a lot. So in this picture, I was at one elementary school, and in the next three years, I would be at two more elementary schools. So it was like move every summer sort of thing, um, which probably, in retrospect, made me a bit more of a people person than I, than I would have been because it forced it. His last job was in Kentucky at the Ford Kentucky truck plant. So I, um, after being up in Detroit and Ohio, I ended up in Kentucky. And... I didn't know anything about horses, but like if you live in Kentucky, you're supposed to, right? And so I was pre-vet. I knew I wanted to do veterinary medicine. I thought I wanted to do companion animal. Uh, I didn't think I wanted to do horses, but I was like, let's try it. So I worked on a broodmare farm um, in Kentucky, 
And um, great experience to learn that. I think every, every kid needs to have a service job and something working with animals to humble them in their life. And, and so it started along this line of being able to take what, what could be perceived as problems and turn them into opportunities. And that's the message I want for tonight. We got a lot of problems going on, but we got a lot of opportunities. So let's focus on the things that we can actually do something about and make a positive difference. So I, I decided that I wanted to go to vet school. Um, I ended up going to Eastern Kentucky University. Ever, anyone else from EKU, right? <laughs> Um, I, 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 my love of horses got extended to the Kentucky Derby, which I still love and still have a killer party when it's socially acceptable. Um, I got into the, the class at Auburn um, after three years. I thought I was going to go to Michigan State my whole life because we had grown up in that area. I was missing a poultry production class, and I would have had to go a whole other semester to get that, but I had all the requirements to apply to Auburn. And so I decided to apply to Auburn. I didn't. My pre-vet advisor told me to. Thank you. And um, I got in after three years undergrad. So the first thing I needed to do, <laughs> like I had an interview and I had no idea. Like, this was back in the map days, right? I had no idea where I was going. It was like, I'm going to go to Atlanta and take a right. That's all I know. Um, I really thought it was in Georgia. True story. Um, I went into the SEC in a way that I was totally naive, and, and anyone that has had an SEC experience knows what that means when it comes to football. So I figured out where it is. They had in-person interviews, which inc included questions about football. <laughs> Fortunately, I was enough of a tomboy that I followed football and actually still enjoy it to this day. So um, I survived the interview, and um, I, I got offered a position in the class, and... Then I did what everyone in Alabama does. <laughs> I had to find a trailer, and it was not going to be a new trailer. It was going to be a used trailer, which I had a 12 by 60 trailer that I bought for $6,300. It came complete with a cat that got passed from vet student to vet student and just got kept there because that's where he was happy, and a possum that would occasionally come up into the bathroom. Um, <laughs> So I, I, was, I was finding a home to live in, which is not advisable in a um, tornado-prone area. Uh, but I really needed to find my place. I wanted to, you know, if, if Auburn was where I was going to be for four years, I needed to find my place. Unfortunately, um, this was my place. We had two veterinary fraternities at the time. OTS allowed women in as regular members. Uh, the other one, Alpha Psi, you, you could be a little sister, but you could not be a member. You could not vote, but you could make cookies and help them out on the weekend. So um, one guess which one I went with. <laughs> and I also said, you know what, we're, we're starting to see a lot of women in, in veterinary medicine. We need some representation on groups like this. And so I became the first female president of OTS at Auburn, which was scandalous at the time. <laughs> And so I really found my home there, and, it, and I'm guessing you can't figure out in this grainy photo, but I am unable to use a pointer, apparently. <laughs> there, uh, right there. So I gave up on the mom's haircuts, um, went with the full-on 80s-style perm, and uh, we were off and running. So there's two things that I really need to make sure I did in vet school, earn my DVM degree, and then uh, pass my board exam so I could be licensed and do what I had been dreaming about as a child. By the way, which is when most people decide they want to be veterinarians is when they're quite young. And so in that vein, um, I was on my way to, I'm going to work in Florida, somewhere near the coast, I'm going to work reasonable hours, and I'm only going to work on companion animals that are nice. And I'm going to be a veterinarian because I don't particularly like people, but I like animals. <laughs> Completely forgot about what's on the other end of the leash. So at that time, it wasn't the board exam now is the NAVLE. The one then, you had two parts. One was the NBE, National Board Exam, and the other was the CCT, which was your clinical competency test. Um, so I took it in Florida. Well, what I haven't added yet was I married my high school sweetheart um, right before my sophomore year of vet school. 
He uh, was a police officer who then became an undercover narcotics agent during our marriage, and there were problems. And so I had decided that was not a good choice on my part. In fact, my dad offered uh, to give me $6,300 that I spent on the trailer not to marry him, but I... <laughs> Um, and, and we were actually, he had already gotten a job down in Florida, so setting the pace of where I was going to go, and um, I was to pass my exams, which at the time, Florida required higher scores. And so I went to Florida to take my exams there. And while at the exam, which is perhaps the most stressful time of your life when you are a veterinary student, guess who shows up to have a party with me the first night when I still have a whole other day of exams to do? The husband, yeah. So it came up to surprise me, and so um, that was, was a, a, a bit of a, um, I didn't need that. Um, but I did take a preceptorship, because I already had that lined up. Um, I packed up my most prized possessions, which were my rescued golden retriever, one of the very red ones with the lucky spots on his tongue, and put him in my Suzuki Samurai with a 60-pound bag of dog food and one suitcase of clothes, and I was off. I had nowhere to live. Um, I ended up staying in a friend's parents' trailer in a 55 and older community and was quickly told my bathing suit was inappropriate. <laughs> and then I got my NBE scores. So I haven't graduated. Preceptorships were the last thing you did at Auburn. You found your MBE scores and then you, you got your degree and your scores and you went off and, and made history. Um, wasn't going to make history with my NBE scores. So did not score what I needed to score to practice in Florida. Um, and then I had a uh, divorce finalized about the week before I graduated. So I said, you know what? I want a different name on my diploma. I want to go back to Henry. And so I was able to do that and had my commencement in June of 1990. So everything's going right as planned so far, right? So then I'm like, okay, now what do I do? Because I'm not moving to Florida with my ex-husband. Um, I'm not moving to Florida, period, because I didn't score high enough. I'm going to have to retake it. So let's look at where I can currently practice and decide what I'm going to do. And you, you will see there's no Ohio or Michigan in this map. It was, <laughs> it was an area that I was completely unfamiliar with before I figured out where Auburn was. And so of these, I am licensed in Georgia and Alabama, and so I took a, a job at a practice in Prattville, Alabama. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> really? Awesome. It was not that big when I was there. Um, and I went into practice with a guy that had been in practice for about 25 years, because I'm like, you know what? I, can, I know the medical stuff, but I don't know how to run a business. Edward Jones will appreciate that, and thank you for your sponsorship, by the way. And so I went into practice with this guy. Um, and he had been the old vet in the town of Prattville forever, and I came in as something unexpected, um, and he was going to teach me the ropes. Three weeks after I started, he had a tractor accident, rolled a tractor over on his leg, he was diabetic, he got gangrene, he had his leg amputated, and he never came back to work. So here I went to practice to learn how to run a practice. Well, thank you, Lord, because... <laughs> You're on. And by the way, they don't really like young female veterinarians in this town because they don't trust you. So that, it, it was indeed a learning experience. And I would like to say that was the beginning of the um, taking the knock knock who's there and saying that must be opportunity. So this has been my philosophy that's gotten me through my career. I highly recommend it. Don't look for the problems, look for the opportunities. The problems are super easy to find. Turns out the opportunities are pretty easy to find, but you got to be looking for them. So, one of the ways is to create your own opportunity. Marilyn made it sound like I had a very cool plan that I decided I would go back to Auburn and become an oncologist. They did not have an oncology residency at Auburn at the time, so that was problematic. Um, and I was trying to figure out how I could do that and convince them that they wanted me when I didn't even pass my NBE with scores that were good for Florida. So I was, I was not number one on their list, right? So I went to them, they had two oncologists on, on staff, and I said, okay, I'll make you this deal. I will work for free during this residency if you let me do moonlighting in 
uh, I was almost at Kansas City, fueled to let me do moonlighting in Columbus, Georgia, and Montgomery, Alabama at the emergency clinics, because I can make money on those shifts, and then I'll do my residency during the day. And um, believe it or not, they didn't even think that was a great idea. <laughs> And, and I was like, you know, I really, I'm worth every penny, and I'm, I'm going to work for free, so give me a shot at this. So finally uh, convinced them. Well, then it turned out they, co they couldn't have me work for free because they couldn't give me a parking pass if I wasn't a paid employee. <laughs> and so they said, you know what, we're going to pay you a dollar a month. And I was like, go for it. That's great. I, I am a paid employee of Auburn University now making a dollar a month. Well, as, as many young people do, I forgot about taxes. <laughs> and to this day, I still have three of these checks that I saved. <laughs> and you'll notice I made 88 cents during that month, but I'm quite proud to say the one below that, which was just the next month, I was up to 90 cents. So, I mean, my rate of return was improving dramatically. Um, the other part I didn't mention was I had fallen in love with a former professor who was still at Auburn, which was another one of the reasons I had decided I kind of wanted to be around Auburn. And um, so he ended up, once I, I was, had a way to get back to Auburn, um, we decided let's see if we can make this work. He proposed to me and we got married in Auburn during my second year of my residency. And then I finished the residency, and he was not that happy at Auburn, and so he was looking for other opportunities, and I was looking for a job, period, as an oncologist. And turns out they had a job at Washington State University, and they wanted somebody to come with, with a, a background that had done oncology but internal medicine. And so the plan was I would start the program out there. So there we are. We got the moving truck that we loaded ourselves, and we went out to the state of Washington, which is a fascinating trip in October. If you want to go from Alabama to the state of Washington and go through a um, climate and culture shock all at the same time, <laughs> mission accomplished. Um, but I, but I, <laughs> one of the themes here is I've always felt like an imposter. And when I got out there, they had me teaching medicine. And, and not just oncology, which was not what I had intended to go into. And, and I knew I was in the wrong place when they had me giving the lecture on infectious diseases that occur in the Pacific Northwest that I had never in my life seen. And so I was posing every day. I was like asking questions and you know, if a student asked me something I couldn't answer, I'm like, I think that's a really good thing for you to look up and we'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> so, we, I needed a better fit. I needed something where I could do oncology. Um, and so we started looking, and at the time, they had a position for me at Kansas State University, but not for my husband. They had a position for my husband at University of Missouri, but not for me. Both of them made spousal accommodations, so we had to pick between the two. And no offense to K-State, but I liked Columbia more than I liked Manhattan, and I liked the fact that there was a med school. And I'm like, I'm an oncologist, and we need to start having more uh, communication between veterinary and human oncology because we can learn some important things. So, got the job there, um, and then went up for what they call mid-probationary review. How, any, who in the room is, is uh, well knowledge in the tenure process? Yeah, that was me. So, um, I did a lot of stuff in my first three years that I can now advise people not to do, like I wrote in journals that I knew veterinarians in practice would read. And it turns out those are not the journals that look good on your resume when you're trying to go up for tenure. And so I, I could have learned a lot, and it's, it's one of my goals in life is to keep other people from going through that um, same pain. But this was my, my three-year review. So you get a mid-probationary review, and then you go up for tenure in your, after six years, and if you don't get it, you're out. Doesn't matter if you're a spousal accommodation, you're out. And so this was what it said on my mid-probationary review about my research and publication, that I was an opportunistic clinical researcher with a variety of interests. Okay, that, that it, it was basically saying she's unfocused and does whatever comes her way. Today, that's cool. Like, they're like, ooh, you're entrepreneurial. But at the time, I was an, op I was an opportunistic clinical researcher. And if that wasn't enough, 
But wait, there's more. We have provided above our opinion and recommendations regarding the direction of Dr. Henry's academic performance in this department. It's difficult to believe that she will successfully complete the P&T process without a strong deviation from her current effort distribution and a reorientation of her priorities. Unconventional, not welcomed. And so at this point, I'm like, okay, well, now where am I? Because my, my husband's killing it, and, <laughs> and he's got me tagging along, and I'm, I'm not killing it because I'm making choices that, had I had appropriate mentorship, I don't think I would have done. So important. If you, if you have an opportunity to mentor those that are younger than you, please do it. We need to, we need to help each other. All right, so what are you going to do at this point? You've got three years to fix it, or you're going to be booted. And so I said, okay, well, we're just going to change the way we do things here. I'm going to build oncology like it's never been built. I'm going to add residents and train them. We are going to require that those residents do research. We're going to show the importance of how that research relates to what we can do in people. And so that maybe some of the scientific knowledge that we have on a basic level can then be translated into things that will help humans with cancer as well. But not losing sight of the fact that we also want to help the animals that have cancer. That's why we went into this in the first place. So if you, if you look at that top picture, that's, that's the team that, that I had been able to help accumulate. And I'm not taking credit for it. I'm just saying once you start building it, they will come if it's a high quality program. Um, I was working at the time with folks at Ellis Fischel Cancer Center, and so we, we had an initiative that we were going to join with MD Anderson. And I, I decided I would work on a book, because that's a good thing to do for tenure, um, and, and for all the reasons I did it the wrong way, but I'm still glad that, that we were able to pull that off. And I got tenured. Now, before someone takes a screenshot of this and puts it out on social media, this is sarcastic. <laughs> you can get fired if you're a tenured faculty member, so, so rest assured that that, that is, is possible. Um, but then at that point, I was like, okay, what would have made my route easier? How can I help people avoid the mistakes that I made? And I wanted to especially raise up the next generation of oncologists, because we were very short as we are today with oncologists and people that could be clinician scientists, like scientists that get the clinical application of things. And so that sort of became my mission. And um, I, I was called Mama Henry by my residents for many, many years. And then it eventually got dropped to Mama Hen, which I have finally embraced. <laughs> But I, I think it's that mindset of, if you come work here, we're going to take care of you. We're gonna, we are going to see that you succeed because we all succeed that way. And so that's been sort of my go-to um, with, with all decisions from that point on. So, <laughs> right? This is the part where things start going as planned. Everything's going to work out just fine. So here we were, the successful academic couple. Um, my husband wanted to be a dean of a vet school, and I told him he was an idiot for wanting to do that, that that had to be the most horrible job anybody could have, because all you do is make people mad all day. So that was my mindset, not his, um, and I, I could end it here if they lived happily ever after. However, um, at the age of 51, he had a heart attack at home and um, passed away that night. And I was left with a whole bunch of kids that we had accumulated, kind of like a hobby. And I had to figure out, okay, now I'm the breadwinner for the family. I got to figure out how to take care of these kids. What do I do? And so I, I, want, I want to give him just a moment because I think I, probably most of you didn't know him, but he still has an impact on, on students and faculty today. So. This got to be uh, the front of the book when I got it finished. I will say that he was never late for anything, and his chapter that he wrote on statistics was the first one that was finished, and he finished it the weekend before he had a heart attack and pa passed away. So he, he was good to his word. He hated my tardiness, I'll tell you that much. All right, so 
Now we're going to have to face it and say, I don't like this situation, but what do I do with it? And one of the things I wanted to take care of first was my family. And I had a bunch of little kids who were now scared that mom was going to die and then what would happen to them. So my first priority was um, I, I need to take care of these kids. And so th the total package was the, the one up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that was the eight that were part of the family when, um, when he passed away. And, and you can see two of them are not like the other. Um, we had two sons that we adopted from Liberia, and that was before Liberia became known for its most famous thing, which was Ebola. Um, and that's a whole other story. But we, we adopted them. So this is what was at home when he passed away, which were the, the five at the, at the bottom. And Mama Hen became kind of uh, in charge of this whole group and making sure that, that their well-being. It was a lifesaver for me. Like, I had, to, I had to just do it, and it allowed me an outlet, and it was something I could have some control over in a, in a life that seemed totally out of control. So in retrospect, not that I would wish that on anyone, but in retrospect, I learned a lot, and I think it, it's important what I did learn. Um, what I did learn <laughs> is that, um, so he had promised the kids, he was always a little overweight, if you might have noticed, um, always had a little bit of high, high blood pressure. He had promised the kids, I'm going to run a marathon by the time I'm 50. And guess what he did not do? And guess what happened at 51? And so in my mind, this made a lot of sense at the time. Okay, if I can run a marathon, that will be very reassuring to my kids. I had run track and cross country in high school and then had done a lot of beer drinking after that <laughs> and was not like a regular runner at the time. So I decided, okay, I'm going to start with a half marathon. So I trained for that. Um, the first one I signed up for was the Mississippi Blues Marathon, half marathon, because I'm like, Mississippi, January, it'll be fairly warm, it won't be hilly. <laughs> Uh, the guy next to me is Bill Rogers, who if you grew up in my era, he was my hero as a, as a runner. Um, he did not do well in this particular event because it was seven degrees. Um, there are a lot of hills <laughs> in Mississippi, and I experienced what felt like every one of them. But I got, I got through my half marathon and uh, was very excited by that. But if you look at the medal, um, yeah, if you do a half marathon, you get a half a medal. <laughs> And I'm like, well, where do I go get my loser hat? Because I have just done the accomplishment of my life, and, and I get half a medal. But uh, I, many things have kept me humble in my life. So I was like, okay, did that. Next thing, how do I transition from this to a marathon? Well, enlist the help of a coach. I was in an online um, support group called uh, Day, uh, DS, Daily Strength. And they have separate groups for, for what your issue is, right? My issue was I am a widow or a widower, and I don't know what the heck I'm doing, and I'm not sleeping, and no one understands my questions or how to talk to me. So on that website was a very geeky guy who looked nothing like my first husband. So you go from um, one body type to a completely different one, um, a, lot, a lot less hair, and was from Wichita, Kansas, and at the time I had no f idea how far away Wichita, Kansas was. But I wasn't, like, this was not a dating site, right? This is where you get support. So I threw it out there that I was trying to run a marathon. He said, I just did one in Dallas. That was my first one. I will help coach you through that, which he did. More about him later. But I got through the, the marathon. Um, I could tell you this was my first marathon. I could tell you this is my last marathon, and both statements would be correct. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't experienced, you've got to do it for the right reasons, I'll tell you that much. But for me, it gave me the headspace to work through a lot of stuff. Like when you have to go do an 18-mile run on a Sunday to get ready for this, that's a lot of thinking time. That's a lot of processing time. And my kids played soccer, and so I went and ran while they played soccer, and we made it work. So I love this. This kind of sums it up. I was like, you know what? I've been knocked down, but I'm going to get up. And you better be running when I get up because I'm coming at you. And that became a very empowering thought to me of if I can do this, I, I can meet challenges. It's unconventional, but this is what I'm going to do. But I hadn't quite figured out what I was going to do job-wise. And there was a little bit of recalculating that had to happen there. 
The other part I didn't tell you, and there's a lot I'm not going to tell you, but we had had job offers from the University of California, Davis. And my husband really wanted to go there. And I really didn't want to pack up all the kids and go across country. I had no family out there. And at one point, I finally said to him, and I don't know why I said this. I don't think it's a coincidence. I said, my biggest fear, this is a lateral move for you. This is not the deanship you want. And I'm afraid we're going to move all the way to California with all these kids, and you're going to have a heart attack, and I'm going to have to figure out how to take care of them out there by myself. I swear I said that. I swear that within a month, he was dead of a heart attack. I, I did not cause it. I really did not <laughs> have anything to do with it. But I am so thankful. That's another situation where we didn't take those job offers. We stayed here. Um, and it, it ended up being exactly what I needed at the time. Just didn't, didn't know why I was going to need it. But what made me saddest is that he had a lot of initiatives that he wanted to do as a food animal veterinarian. A small animal, a companion animal, primarily oncologist, has no business trying to do those kind of things. And so there became a disconnect of how do I, how do I find the job where I can financially take care of everybody here in this university and still work towards pushing some of the initiatives that I know were so important to him. And so I had to identify how I could do that. Well, it turns out there was a, a program at the time that the provost at the time had started called Mizzou Advantage. And it had four areas um, of emphasis, and one of those was called One Health, One Medicine. I went to a meeting in Kansas City where there were physicians, veterinarians, pharmaceutical company folks, um, uh, animal health industry folks, and I remember sitting back and looking at the crowd, having these discussions, and I was like, that's what I, I want to connect to people like this. That's, that's what's fun. And so Mizzou Advantage gave me the, that opportunity. So I decided to apply for the job as facilitator for One Health, One Medicine. Um, I, I should have known better because when I contacted the provost via email at about 12.30 on a Friday night after I got back from that meeting, he answered me almost immediately. <laughs> And so I should have known that upper administration is not quite right, that they're up uh, doing that work on a Friday night that late. So I was a little bit skeptical of how this was going to work. And the other thing that, that added to my suspicion is one of his favorite sayings was, okay, we're basically building the plane in the air. As it turns out, um, I, I ended up, my, my uh, current spouse, who will describe who that is, um, worked for an airline company in Wichita, Kansas. So this wasn't all that reassuring to me. The thing wasn't even going to be built, and we're up in the air trying to figure it out as we go. So that was the analogy. However, it also gave us the opportunity to be really creative and say, what can we do differently here that can't be done anywhere else? Why, what's the advantage of having a vet school and a med school at the same site? What's the advantage of having an engineering school, a communication school? Why does that work? Well, because a lot of what we see as veterinarians, which you see as pet owners, um, it, it happens in species besides uh, people. So I just put a few examples up here. I mean, uh, lymphoma is one of the cancers, degenerative di disc disease, how many have a bad back, right? Uh, epilepsy, occurs in dogs, cardiomyopathy, and this is just a short list. So I wanted to bring my veterinary oncology viewpoint to this, but say, these are the important things we can learn from each other. So let's quit being in silos and let's work together and, and see what we can do. So, you know, this was my idea of what a laboratory looked like. And I, and I said, we're going to take all these resources that we have and we're going to find ways to capitalize on it and maximize the good that we can do. But it's scary. It's like something that hasn't been done. So the big thing is, how do, we, how do you not be afraid of that? Well, I ended up, I got offered the position. I was the um, faculty facilitator from Mizzou Advantage. I, it was mentioned that I also had an appointment at the, at the human, um, at the School of Medicine. They had an opening for an associate director of research, and turns out the guy that had hired, that had been my first person at Mizzou that I met when I interviewed was the head of the cancer center. And he said, I think you should do this job. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm a veterinarian, and this is a human hospital, and you're telling me to direct a bunch of physicians of what to do research on? So that was scary. I will admit that. Um, but it was a very good year in that I also uh, ended up marrying that guy from Wichita, Kansas. 
um, who has reminded me repeatedly that I had him solidly in the friend zone for a year and a half. <laughs> but when I decided, I decided big. And we had a wedding on the beach with all but two of our family members, and the rest is history there. And I also felt like I had found a home with the cancer center and that this really was a place where I could take advantage of that and, and make a difference. And so I did accept that position um, at Ellis Fischel. And what it did is it really gave us a seat at the table. And I, and I can't stress enough how important it is to give people that seat at the table. If you have a way to facilitate that, do it. Because that's where differences happen, when people can bring their expertise and quit trying to show off and tell me what you know that I don't, and let's say, okay, let's all come at this problem from different directions and have some solutions. I still didn't believe I deserved it, though. I was, you know, I still have this imposter syndrome thing of, I, I got in here some weird way and I'm not really supposed to be here. Um, and unfortunately, you can't just go by self-esteem, right? That has to come from within, and that's the hardest part of all this. You can, you can teach people a lot of stuff, but that self-esteem is something. That's a personal journey you have to work on, and I, I am working on it as, as recently as this afternoon. So. <laughs> um, and one of my big things was I didn't have a Ph.D. Okay, I had a DVM and I had a master's degree, but in the med school, if you don't have a Ph.D., you're not a scientist, right? And certainly if you are a DVM instead of an M.D., what are you doing here? And so I, you know, I wore that imposter syndrome full on, thinking, I, you know, okay, I'll take it because it's an interim position, but I'm not the one that should be doing this. Well, if you want to, you know, take things and kind of switch them up, do the unconventional, because that's that's a, a good thing. And and in the end, um, this was my door at Ellis Michelle. And they didn't know what I had, so they ended up putting all the letters together and saying I had an MSDVM, and nobody knew what that meant anyway. <laughs> and I was interim, so who cares, right? So that was my illustrious career at Ellis Michelle Cancer Center. While doing that, um, our uh, associate dean for research at the vet school said, I'm going to retire. He called me in his office and he said, I think you should do this job um, as my replacement. And I'm like I, like, I don't even have a PhD. Like, everybody I'll be telling what to do has a PhD, and they're not going to listen to me. And he's like, no. And I said, I don't know a lot of the ins and outs. And he said, well, don't worry, because we've got Donna Stearns, and she d really does all the work. And so <laughs> you, just, you just get with Donna, and she will take care of you. And I was like, all right, that's, that's scary, but can I do all three of these together? And I started seeing that there's a lot of overlap between the areas. So I'm like, okay, it's three different jobs, but they all kind of overlap, so I think we can make this work. Really, what could go wrong? <laughs> so I accepted the job. We went on a family vacation to South Carolina. While I was there, I got a phone call. Um, and mind you, this is not just my first 100 days. This is before I've started the job. That Donna Stearns had passed away unexpectedly. Oh, and you start your new job in two weeks and no one knows where anything is or how it's been done for the past 25 years because Donna did it all. So yeah, it's still going just as planned, right? Um, so kind of recovered from that, said, all right, we're gonna regroup, and then um, uh, I'm starting to get the hang of what research looks like on a campus as a whole, what F&A means, all that good stuff. Um, and then there's a government shutdown. That hadn't been a huge concern for me as a veterinarian. Um, that was employed. As someone who is waiting for money from the government to do their research, that's kind of a big deal. And so now I was the head of a research job where nobody was getting their money and we still had to get things paid for. So um, another challenge. But you know what? In that area, I found what I think was really the, the sweet spot, that synergism that kind of brings it all together, that makes us a place where we can make a difference. And really, I, I love what Steve Jobs says and this one about, uh, you know, it, it's just connecting people. And that's what, what everybody here today can do. And, and you can connect people in ways that are going to have an impact. You don't have to do it all yourself. But you have to be smart enough to recognize the opportunities when they're there, make them happen, and then don't be afraid to go ahead and do that. The only thing that, that doesn't work well is when you have three administrative jobs and they give you a stipend for each one of those and none of them goes to your base salary. My Edward Jones people will appreciate your base salary is what your uh, retirement is based on. And so what I really wanted to do 
It's just, okay, I'm not asking for more money. You just pay me the same amount of money, but it's base salary. Can we do that? And the answer was, um, you need to get a job offer somewhere else. I'm like, seriously. And so a, a school that will remain unnamed was recruiting me forever. And I'm like, I no, that's like the worst job. Why would I apply to be a dean? So after this, I said, okay, then I'll go apply to be a dean and I'll play the game. Um, and they had an interim dean in place. So guess who got that position? When it was all said and done, it got down to two of us and the interim dean got the position. So then I've, I've got no leverage, I have no job offer, so um, I decided to continue in this vein and applied for, for another one and that one had an interim who I got down to the finalist and they chose the interim. And so I'm like, okay, and then I applied to another one and still didn't get it. And I'm like, God, how do I, how do I keep getting to the finalist stage and then I don't get it? Like, why, if they're taking me that far, why aren't we completing it? And it started dawning on me that I looked a little different than what most candidates looked like that were applying for deanships. I will tell you that in this picture, there are four deans or people that eventually became deans. And, and only one of them is a woman. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to mentor and to support other women into achieving that. And I think part of it is the perception about us. Um, you know, who we are as people, we need, to, we need to change that narrative, okay? Don't tell me women aren't good at math. <laughs> My Edward Jones people, we're pretty darn good at math, right? Um, we're not good at everything, but we have something to contribute. And so um, I, the other thing I learned from Kansas is, is uh, tornadoes are more frequent in Wichita than I realized. But I also thought, you know, people persevere through everything. And I've persevered through... Uh, uh, the biggest loss of my life, um, it probably would make sense to just step back and say, okay, I'm not going to continue to try to be a dean. But now I've been out there and I've realized that if I could get this job, I could have a real impact. I could, have, I could do something that would be important. So I'm going to do it one more time um, because we got a dean here who's not leaving and there's another position that came open and all I got to do is, you know, figure out what that magic sauce is. And then the dean that we had said, guess what, I'm leaving. And by the way, he showed us the slide when he decided to leave of the island he was going to live on <laughs> and said, um, I, I am leaving as of this date. And that was the warning that we had. And I'm like, okay, I have applied for four deanships thinking there was never going to be anything here. And now I'm, he asked me to be the interim dean. But again, I got sucked in by it's only interim. You can try it out and see if you like it. So I did indeed become the interim dean, but still didn't have that job security because there was going to be a dean search and I had to, to get the job or find another one. And really got brought in at a time when there was a lot of turmoil on campus and they needed some, some direction. And so I, I went through three additional searches. One of them was the offer of a lifetime of a, at, a, at a, the most prestigious site I could have gotten an offer. Um, another one I withdrew from because, lo and behold, I got an offer from Mizzou, and that was the one I was like, you know what, I can make a difference here. Because the other places had, had female deans before. They didn't have all the capacity that we have at Mizzou um, and the potential. They were doing great, but there wasn't going to be anything I could do other than, like, you know, make sure I didn't screw things up. And so... I turned down that offer and I said, I'm going to stay at Mizzou because I'm here for a reason and, and there are things that need to be done. And so a big part of that, I'll admit, is that I wanted to be the first female dean here because I think we need female leaders in the profession. I still believe that. Um, and did things a little bit unconventionally, um, but I, I can tell you that I was daily saying this is the best job I've ever had. And what I didn't realize is the impact it was having on our students. So we had um, what was fondly called, and I'm sorry for the men in the audience to do this, but it was fondly called the wall of men because these are the pictures of all the previous deans. Um, and normally you don't get your picture up until you leave. However, they take the picture on day one of your deanship so that you look fresh and happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the female students were actually saying, we want you to put your picture up. And I'm like, I don't want to put my picture up. And they're like, yeah, but you, people need to see that. And in fact, we want it in the dean's office. And I'm like, 
I got to walk in and look at myself every day? Come on. And the original picture in my head was enormous, so I at least got him to, to change that. But I didn't realize what an impact something as simple as that could have, and I do think that's important. Um, working with people like Sharon Deem in that top picture from the, from the zoo, uh, Dina Ladd's been great with Missouri Cures and, and the wise uh, meetings that we have about women in, in uh, science and um, entrepreneurial and research. Um, and then COVID, so um, I actually did get bleeped out of my own Dean's video message, but that was during COVID. I'm like, we are making this graduation stuff out as we go, trying to pull it off during COVID. So um, that has been an absolute thrill to be able to get through that. And so in, in summary, I would say that, you know, all of this is about finding a way to do what you love. There's an old saying of if, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. But to me, having, making a difference is what's important as well, and finding out what that why is. And when you can do that, I love this, this quote from Einstein, perhaps because I like his hair. Um, <laughs> creativity is intelligence having fun. And so if you're not happy in what you're in, I'm like, then maybe it's not the right thing for you. But get what you're in, get, what, get into the job that makes you happy, and then have an impact in that position. And... Um, this is a saying that is, has kind of been my philosophy. I don't necessarily know it's great for everybody, um, but you got to be able to take that leap and believe that the net's going to appear. That is, I can tell you that is not a very popular um, opinion with upper administration, but I, I do think you have to be willing to take some risks. And the story for another day that I will share with anyone that wants it is um, my idea of imposter syndrome. If you have it, you know it. If you um, it, yeah, I see some hands already, and I, while it is painful for me to be vulnerable and tell all of the things that didn't go right and what a failure I was in so many ways, and yet it's, it's what got me where I am today. And so um, I, the other thing that's frowned upon in some places is a dean that has tattoos. Um, so I have one that shows um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's one that says fearless. And that's my reminder to the students. So. And I would love to open it up to questions, comments, concerns. Yes, I think we have a, a microphone because there are people I think that are live streaming, so they need the microphone. First, I owe you a thank you and the University of Missouri's Cancer Care Center in Wentzville for extending our 12 and a half year old rescued lab mix oh. for three more years of productivity and happiness until 15 and a half. Well, thank you for that. And, and that's, a, that's a facility where we teach students as well. So again, that's kind of unconventional and it doesn't make sense to everybody, but I need to hear one story like that and that's, that's all I need to hear. It's, Radiation only extended her life. That's awesome. Which she sailed through. Not so much for us on the trip. Yeah. But we have a, we think, 11-year-old rescued German Shepherd, our third consecutive from here. Um, we know indigenous to the breed is separation anxiety, sensitive stomach, vocality, um, anxiety. Um, she's getting very picky about eating. She's got perfect blood work. We've gone to chicken and, of course, Purina food. Um, but she still has a sensitive stomach about once a month. In addition to her separation anxiety, we don't know if there's a connection. And, and the separation anxiety, is, is those of you that have had rescue animals, it's, a, it's kind of a, a big issue right now more than ever because there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time at home with their newly adopted pets. And by the way, they were looking at everything. So like everything was an emergency that needed to be dealt with that day. And then they're having to go back to the office and not all offices will let you take the pet with you. That's hard. I mean, my dogs we're probably like, good riddance, we're so tired of having you around. But if, if you're new to an adoptive situation and then you're not there, you know, those are, those are real issues and they have real health impacts. So uh, bless you for, for taking that on. And uh, I, I personally have rescue uh, pit bulls and golden retrievers, which if you've had a golden retriever and you haven't been impacted by cancer in that breed, um, I can tell you that it, it's, it's a problem, and we need to figure it out, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. 
Come on, throw them at me. I love the One Health space and what's been done there with the research. So what's going on in One Health right now? Like, so. so another like silver lining of COVID is people are understanding what veterinary medicine can contribute. Um, and I think, you know, if you just look at the example of people that were surprised that veterinarians were then going to be able to give vaccines to peep the COVID vaccines, like that was some great skill that we didn't have before COVID. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we kind of do that every day. And, and so I, I think the realization, not just of the skill set, but of the importance of, we need to be able to recognize diseases that can be crossed between human and animal species. And we need to be proactive. Let's be honest. We've been working on this reactionary method forever and it doesn't work. And so let's look at it and prepare for the, the future. I think we're, we're preparing for right now, and that doesn't, that's not a good, good strategy. So I think it's helped us in that regard. As far as applications to vet school, I was sharing with some folks, last year we had over 1,500 applicants for 125 positions. That was a new record. The deadline's not even up for two more days, and we've got over, uh, over 2,100 applications this year. And, and you know, still at 125 because we're, we're space limited currently. So um, there are more crises coming and we need to be creative about how to fix that problem, how to get more technicians trained because we need to be more efficient in how we do business. So good and bad, but you know, it's like you got to look at what's the opportunity and how can we take advantage of it and make, make this place better. So back to the golden retrievers and the cancer issue. <laughs> For those of us who have heartbreakingly um, experienced that, is it an overbreeding situation or an inbreeding or whatever the correct term is? Because uh, I, I'm hesitant to get another one. I always say I'm not getting another one, and I keep doing it. But um, it's it's you know obviously it's multifactorial. So it's smart breeding that we need to do. So we need to have educated breeders that that breed in a smart way and so if we know there's a genetic mutation that occurs in a line let's not keep breeding that dog and perpetuating that um, and so you know I think some of the most important work we do is in genetics and we're, we're blessed in that regard we got a cat geneticist we got a dog geneticist we got a cow geneticist I mean we've got a, an expertise pool that is nowhere else in the world but we need to make sure that we're utilizing that to help the animals as well as people. So when we find, you know, 20 genetic mutations because of testing that's being done in dogs, if it's only one that actually occurs in people, that's kind of important because then we can be screening for that ahead of time. So I don't, I don't necessarily think it's a, a just an overbreeding problem. It, we need to be, we need to be smart about it, and and we need to make sure that that we're providing that opportunity to share that education. Great question though, thank you. Yeah. Oh. When you were in an environment with, um, without a PhD or maybe less experience than some other team members that you were in charge of managing, what was your most effective leadership strategy? It, it, it may, I mean, really it's being authentic. You know, I, I think if, if you have the power to laugh at yourself, you're never going to run out of material, right? <laughs> and, I, and I think people, they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And, and part of that is being that mentor. And part of that is being able to admit when you don't know something or when you can improve and then actually do that. So if I make a mistake, I'm not going to pretend I didn't make a mistake. I'm going to say, you know, what? That, was, that was a bad call, but this is what I learned from it. And I just keep coming back to that. Do the right thing, and if you screw up, learn from it, and don't make that same mistake again. Love that question, though. I like the whole animal print thing you guys got going on. I got to tell you, I walked in, I'm like, oh my god, I love the clothes in here. <laughs> That's awesome. Anything else? Do we have any questions from our live chat? 
Okay, well, I think that will wrap up our Q&A, unless we have any final takers. Okay. I, I will ask you the new, uh, we do a video each month called the Dean's Video Message, which we couldn't figure out what to call it until I realized that DVM stands for Dean's Video Message. I'm like, all right, we got our name. Um, but every month we feature something. The one that we just are putting out, I think it'll be out tomorrow um, on our webpage, really gives sort of a, an overview of veterinary medicine. It's our 75th anniversary as a college, and I, if, if you're interested, I'd love for you to, to watch those and, and share them with people that might want to know that. So thank you so much for this opportunity. All right, all right, I like people now. <laughs> thank you so much, I appreciate it. Well, thank you all for that standing ovation. I think it was well-deserved, and I bet everybody has at least one or two or five or 20 takeaways from tonight, so hopefully we can all help to empower women. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that the University of Missouri has a very strong affiliation with the Humane Society of Missouri, so I know Dr. Henry would be honored if any of you consider either joining the Women's Leadership Council, renewing your membership, or upgrading. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Kathy Warnick for what you've all been waiting for. Kathy. Thank you, thank you, Marilyn. Wasn't that a fabulous talk? I loved it, loved it, loved it. Yay, Dr. Henry. You just knocked it out of the park. Wow, wow, wow. We are oh so happy you came tonight. And you have been just a fabulous, just an incredible speaker. So let's give her another big hand. And, <laughs> and she said thank you all. And now I wanted to give 